Hello, I'm Richard Vobes, and today I've come to see if I can find a toll gate. This one is at Ashcombe. It's the Ashcombe Toll. It's not all there. A bit like me, really. Let's see if we can find it. I'm walking on the South Downs Way in Sussex. It's a hundred mile track that goes from Eastbourne all the way up to Winchester in Hampshire. You can take in some beautiful countryside, see the hills, the sheep, all sorts of old flint buildings. It's lovely. What you wouldn't expect to see along here is cars motoring up and down. Yet, a couple of hundred years ago, tracks like this were the only way to get about. The roads were awful, mucky, wet, damp, rutted, and that's the good times. You can see exactly what I mean here, look, look at this. Flooded. If you're trying to get to market and you're walking along, you're going to have to wade through that, you're going to get wet. So what happened to the roads then? After all, in AD 43, the Romans came and built fabulous straight ones, didn't they? They did. After they left, though, some 400 years later, the roads were neglected and soon fell into disrepair. An outrage. But there are still 117 Roman roads left in the UK, if you know where to look. Other so-called roads created by the ancient Britons, the invading Anglo-Saxons and even the Normans were no more than dirt tracks, dry and dusty in the summer and wet and muddy in the winter and impassable most of the time. As transport and travel became important to a civilised world, it meant that the roads needed to be improved. So this became the responsibility of the landowners, although in actual fact all that this meant was that the squires would muck about with the roads just in front of their own gates. In the Tudor period, things changed. The road maintenance was handed over to each parish and legislation required every householder to contribute six days of work a year on the upkeep of the roads. Now, one has to bear in mind that these weren't professional road builders or uh, stonemasons or anything like that. These would have been anything from tradespeople of various expertise to farm labourers. So, who knows what kind of situation the roads got themselves into with that lot, trying to sort of attack them and prepare them and look after them. So imagine that you are a weary traveller, trying to cut across the countryside to the next town or village to keep an important appointment. It's dark and late, and the dirt track heads off through the forest. Behind each tree, there could be danger. There could be a highwayman just waiting for you to pass by. And all the time, you are exposed, all the time. You don't know who's behind the next bush, behind the next tree. There were thieves, there were vagabonds, there were all kinds of people. And they were there to take your money, to take your possessions. On the roads was a dangerous prospect. You wouldn't really want to go there. I'm walking across the old toll bridge in Shoreham in West Sussex. This is the River Ada that's uh, flowing underneath. It's a very old bridge. It was originally built in 1781, although this is actually the 1960 rebuild of the same thing. You can see it's uh, in a bit of dilapidated state. There's a bit of a project going on to uh, refurbish the bridge. We've got some protective uh, mesh fence here to stop you from falling in. Toll bridges have been in use since very early periods. Someone made a structure to ease the crossing of a river and expected a payment of some sort for their efforts. Many landowners built timber or stone bridges and would collect a fee. 
But that might be anything from a bundle of hay, a bag of coal, a fresh lamb, an old pig, or even a fatted calf. Rarely did money change hands in the first instances, as the peasant farmers crossing the bridges barely had any. They bartered their crossing fees with other methods of payment, and everyone was happy. What people weren't happy with was the quality, or rather the lack of quality, of the roads themselves. I mean, they wanted to travel, but they didn't want to get bogged down in all that mud. They didn't want to wander down a maze of overgrown paths that petered into nowhere. And they didn't want their coaches and their cartwheels to take repeated knocks and fall off every 20 minutes. So in 1663, the Turnpikes Trust came into fruition and the toll gate arrived. It was there to take money, to charge money, as people went through it, to pay for the upkeep of the roads. Well, that wasn't as easy as it sounds, because the charges, the tariffs, became quite convoluted. This is Upper Beeding in West Sussex, a tiny village that's situated adjacent to the banks of the River Ada, a couple of miles north from the Shoreham toll bridge we saw earlier. In 1807, a new turnpike road was built along the Ada Valley from Upper Beeding to Old Shoreham. The old weatherboarded toll house was located along this road. It is, alas, no more. It remained abandoned for many years and soon became dilapidated and began to fall to bits. Here's what it would have looked like in its former days, thanks to computer graphics. But better than that, it was actually saved and moved in 1974 to the Weald and Downland Museum in Singleton in West Sussex. And here it is, perfectly restored. For every horse, mule, ass or other beast, except dogs, drawing any coach, Berlin, chariot, chase, hearse, gig, wagon, wain, dray or cart, fourpence halfpenny. For any dog drawing any truck, burrow or carriage for the space of a hundred yards or more, one penny. So it cost money to use the tolls. In 1797, the British one penny looked like this. On one side, it had an image of King George III, that's the one that went mad, and the Roman goddess Britannia, the now personified symbol of the United Kingdom, on the other. And with two of these, I could travel on horseback for a limited distance on a reasonably maintained road. How lovely. Pretty unique, isn't it? But what is it? This round house in the middle of nowhere, this random building. It's the Ashcombe Toll House and it's nearly 200 years old. The Ashcombe Toll House was built in 1820. In fact, there were two of these curious round houses on each side of the road. The other was unfortunately demolished during road widening procedures. For a long time, this solitary historic relic lay abandoned at the edge of the main A27 between Brighton and Lewis. It was eventually claimed by Sussex Heritage, who've been able to look after it ever since, and now it's a Grade II listed building. This isn't the main toll house, however, but actually the Lengthman's Tool Store. The Lengthman was effectively a road worker who maintained the turnpike roads. The old shuttered windows have been bricked up now, but would have given a view along both directions, allowing oncoming traffic to be observed. I don't know why, but I do find these old toll gate buildings absolutely fascinating and quite romantic. Although if you were heading any difference, the tolls would have been quite a nuisance and expensive. They were usually no more than eight miles apart. And in 1840, at the peak of the Turnpike Trusts, there were 24,000 roads in England and some 7,000 tolls. Must have been quite crippling. Let's imagine what the original Ashcombe toll might have looked like.
This is Tevil Gate, the Georgian Victorian seaside resort in Worthing, West Sussex. This is where I live. Well, not here, but this is actually a stone throw from where I live. Somewhere here, more or less where I'm standing, used to be the old toll gate, the turnpike. It's actually called Tevil Gate, this section. There used to be a large pond. There was a stream, the Tevil stream, that used to flow through it. And fields, meadows, windmills, beautiful. It's right at the edge of the entrance, the northern entrance to Worthing. All that is gone now. And unfortunately, what we see is this awful monstrosity. There's been buildings and bits and pieces here for a while, but in the 60s, they came along and they put up some terrible, dreadful designs. The 60s period was abysmal. If you come about three miles north of Tevil Gate, you'll come through Findon Valley, which is where I'm coming through now. This is just sort of getting onto the busy A27, uh, A24, sorry, that goes north up towards London. If you come to the point that's just at the bottom of Boast Hill, you'll come to an area here which, at the moment, has not a great deal to show for itself. Just, in fact, a fence. Here was the second toll gate, the toll gate heading north. Beautiful old thing, which it was here until about the 1960s. And then, for some reason, it disappeared completely. And all that's left is the plot of land that it was in. So they haven't built on it, it's just not really gone anywhere. Another Sussex village that had a turnpike road was in Bramber. Situated just below the ruins of the old Norman castle is the old Tollgate restaurant and hotel. But back in the idyllic rural days of the 17 and 1800s, before the roar of motor cars, there was another weather-boarded iconic Tollgate, lost forever now when it was demolished in 1885. Sacrilege. So thanks to the advent of the Turnpike Trusts, the roads improved and transportation was good. And it wasn't really until the mid-19th century when the railways came along that people started to abandon the roads and head for the rails. It was a far easier mode of transport. And in fact, until the motor car came along, did the roads really come unto themselves. So finally, in 1888, the Turnpike Trust disbanded and handed over the upkeep of the roads to the county councils. And slowly, one by one, the old toll gates and turnpike huts started to disappear, turned into quaint tea rooms, bed and breakfast businesses, or get completely demolished thanks to the road widening schemes and the demand of faster transport. Well, I hope you've enjoyed watching and exploring the world of the Sussex toll gates. And until the next video, I'm Richard Vobes. Thank you. Back to the South Downs way, I think. Bye-bye. <laughs>